Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, and welcome to our 10,000 subscriber special. First of all, to all of you who are part of the Uncivil Law family, thank you. Thank you for being here during the past year where we have seen such tremendous growth, and thank you for being part of the Uncivil Law family. Without you, this would not be as much fun to do. It would not be as much of a pleasure. I am grateful that each one of you are here and part of the journey. And I have been saving this article for the 10,000 subscriber special. This is a sort of tongue in cheek article that helps to explain many of the questions people ask me. Questions like, what is common law? Why can't you just write a statute that covers all contingencies? What does it mean for something to be precedent? How does a prior case inform the decision in a later case? How does precedent change the understanding of what a legal language means? How does it change what the statute means over time? And how does, how does case law from time to time even corrupt the original understanding of what a law was meant to be? And so this article helps to explain all that. It helps to explain how something that is written for one purpose gets modified over time. It explains how precedent changes the understanding of a case. It shows why writing law is really, really hard. And it is, it is a sort of a joke article, but it makes a very serious point in the end. So this article, which I'm going to read in its entirety, is called, The Food Stays in the Kitchen. Everything I needed to know about statutory interpretation, I learned by the time I was nine. So we're going to read this article together and you too will understand how common law works, how statutory interpretation works, how case law works, how precedent works, how judges change the understanding of things over time, and how even our best attempts to revise things don't really amount to much in the end. Let's get started with this. The food stays in the kitchen. Everything I need to know about statutory interpretation I learned by the time I was nine. Written by Hillel Y. Levin. On March the 23rd, 1986, the following proclamation, henceforth known as Ordinance 7.3, was made by the Supreme Lawmaker, Mother. I am tired of finding popcorn kernels, pretzel crumbs, and pieces of cereal all over the family room. From now on, no food may be eaten outside the kitchen. Thereupon, litigation arose. Father, Chief Justice, issued the following ruling on March the 30th, 1986. Defendant Anne, age 14, was seen carrying a glass of water into the family room. She was charged with violating Ordinance 7.3, the rule. We hold that drinking water outside the kitchen does not violate the rule. The rule prohibits food from being eaten outside the kitchen. This prohibition does not extend to water, which is a beverage, rather than food. Our interpretation is confirmed by Webster's Dictionary, which defines food to mean, in relevant part, a material consisting essentially of protein, carbohydrate, and fat used by the body of an organism to sustain growth, repair, and vital processes, and to furnish energy and nutriment in solid form, plainly water, which contains no protein, carbohydrate, or fat, and which is not in solid form, is not a food. Customary usage further substantiates our distinction between food and water. Ordinance 6.2, authored by the very same Supreme Lawmaker, declares, after you get home from school, have some food and something to drink, and then do your homework. This demonstrates that the Supreme Lawmaker speaks of food and drink separately and is fully capable of identifying one or both as appropriate. After all, if food used in a family code included beverages, then the word drink in Ordinance 6.2 would be redundant and mere surplus. Thus, had the Supreme Lawmaker wished to prohibit beverages from being taken out of the kitchen, she could have easily done so by declaring that no food or drink is permitted outside the kitchen. Our understanding of the word food to exclude water is further buttressed by the evident purpose of the rule. The Supreme Lawmaker enacted the rule as a response to mess produced by solid foods, water, 
even when spilled, does not produce a similar kind of mess. Some may argue that the cup from which the defendant was drinking water may, if left in the room, itself be a mess, but we are not persuaded. The language of the rule speaks to the supreme lawmaker's concern with small particles of food, rather than to a more generalized concern with containers in which food is held. A cup or other container bears a greater resemblance to other bric-a-brac, such as toys and backpacks, to which the rule does not speak, than it does to the food spoken of in the rule. Although we need not divine the supreme lawmaker's reasons for such a distinction, there are at least two plausible explanations. First, it could be that small particles of food left around the house are more problematic than a stray cup or bowl because they find their way into hard to reach places and may lead to rodent infestation. Second, it is possible that the supreme lawmaker was unconcerned with containers being left in the family room because citizens of this jurisdiction have been meticulous about removing such containers. Whereupon further litigation ensued. Babysitter Sue Justice issued the following ruling on April the 12th, 1986. Defendant Beatrice, age 12, is charged with violating ordinance 7.3 by drinking a beverage, to wit, orange juice, in the family room. The defendant relies on our ruling of March the 30th, 1986, which held that drinking water outside the kitchen does not violate the ordinance and urges us to conclude that all beverages are permitted in the family room under Ordinance 7.3. While we believe this is a difficult case, we agree. As we have previously explained, the term food does not extend to beverages. Our hesitation stems not from the literal meaning of the ordinance, which strongly supports defendant's claim, but rather from an understanding of its purpose. As we have previously stated, and as evidenced by the language of the ordinance itself, the ordinance was enacted as a result of the supreme lawmaker's concern with mess. Unlike the case with water, if the defendant were to spill orange juice on the couch or rug in the family room, the mess would be problematic, perhaps even more so than the mess produced by crumbs of food. It is thus difficult to infer why the supreme lawmaker would choose to prohibit solid foods outside the kitchen but permit orange juice. Nevertheless, we are bound by the plain language of the ordinance and by precedent. We are confident that if the Supreme Lawmaker disagrees with the outcome in this case, she can change or clarify the law accordingly. Whereupon, further litigation incurred. Grandma, Senior Justice, issued the following ruling on May the 3rd, 1986. Defendant Charlie, age 10, is charged with violating the ordinance 7.3 by eating popcorn in the family room. The defendant contends, and we agree, the ordinance does not apply in this case. Ordinance 7.3 was enacted to prevent messes outside the kitchen. This purpose is demonstrated by the language of the ordinance itself, which refers to food being left all over the family room as the immediate cause of its adoption. Such messes are produced only when one transfers food from a container to his or her mouth outside the kitchen. During that process, what the ordinance refers to as eating, crumbs and other food particles often fall out of the eater's hand and onto the floor or sofa. As the record shows, the defendant placed all the popcorn into his mouth prior to leaving the kitchen. He then merely masticated and swallowed while being in the family room. At no time was there any danger that a mess would be produced. We are certain that there was no intent to prohibit merely the chewing or swallowing of food outside the kitchen. After all, the Supreme Lawmaker has expressly permitted the chewing of gum in the family room. It would be senseless and absurd to treat gum differently than popcorn that has been ingested prior to leaving the kitchen. If textual support is necessary to support this obvious and common sense interpretation, abundant support is available. First, the ordinance prohibits food from being eaten outside the kitchen. The term eat is defined to mean to take in through the mouth as food, ingest, chew and swallow in turn. The defendant, having only chewed and swallowed, did not eat. Further, the ordinance prohibits eating rather than bringing of food outside the kitchen. And indeed, food is often brought out of the kitchen and through the family room, as when school lunches are delivered to the front door for car pull pickup. There is no reason to treat food enclosed in a brown bag any differently from food enclosed within the defendant's mouth. 
Finally, if any doubt remains as to the meaning of the ordinance as it pertains to the chewing and swallowing of food, we cannot punish the defendant for acting reasonably and in good faith reliance upon the text of the ordinance and our past pronouncements as to its meaning of intent. Whereupon, further litigation ensued. Uncle Rick, Justice, issued the following ruling on May the 20th, 1986. Defendant Charlie, age 10, is charged with violating the ordinance 7.3, the rule, by bringing a double thick mint chocolate chip milkshake into the family room. Were I writing on a clean slate, I would surely conclude the defendant has violated the rule. A double thick milkshake is food because it contains protein, carbohydrate, and or fat. Further, the purpose of the rule, to prevent messes, would be undermined by the permitting of a double thick milkshake to be brought into the family. Indeed, it makes little sense to treat a milkshake differently from a pretzel or scoop of ice cream. However, I am not writing on a clean slate. Our precedents have now established that all beverages are permitted outside the kitchen under the rule. The defendant relied upon those precedents in good faith. Further, the Supreme Lawmaker has had ample opportunity to clarify or change the law to pro prohibit any or all beverages from being bought out of the kitchen, and she has elected not to exercise that authority. I can only conclude that she is satisfied with the status quo. Whereupon, further litigation ensued. Grandma, Senior Justice, issued the following ruling on July the 2nd, 1986. Defendant Ann, age 14, is charged with violating Ordinance 7.3 by eating apple slices in the family room. As we have repeatedly held, the ordinance pertains only to messy foods. Moreover, the ordinance explicitly refers to popcorn kernels, pretzel crumbs, and pieces of cereal. Sliced apples, not being messy, and certainly no worse than orange juice and milkshakes, which have been permitted in our prior decisions, and being wholly dissimilar from the crumbling foods listed in the ordinance do not come within the meaning of the ordinance. We also find it significant that the consumption of healthy foods, such as sliced apples, is behavior that this jurisdiction supports and encourages. It would be odd to read the ordinance in a way that there was discourage such healthy behaviors by limiting them to the kitchen. Whereupon, further litigation ensued. Aunt Sarah, Justice, issued the following ruling on August the 12th, 1986. Defendant Beatrice, age 13, is charged with violating Ordinance 7.3 by eating pretzels, popcorn, cereal, and birthday cake in the family room. Under ordinary circumstances, the defendant would clearly be subject to the ordinance. However, the circumstances giving rise to defense action in this case are far from ordinary. The defendant celebrated her 13th birthday on August the 10th, 1986. For the celebration, she invited four of her closest friends to the sleepover. During the evening and as part of the festivities, the celebrants watched a movie in the family room. Chief Justice Father provided those presents with drinks and snacks, including the aforementioned said pretzels, popcorn, and cereal for consumption during the movie watching. Father admonished the defendant to clean up after the movie, and there's no evidence in the record suggesting the defendant failed to do so. We frankly concede that defendant's actions were violative of the plain meaning of the ordinance. However, given the special and unique nature of the occasion, the fact that Father, a representative of Supreme Lawmaker, as well as of this court, implicitly approved the defendant's actions, and the apparent efforts of the defendant to uphold the spirit of the ordinance by cleaning up after her friends, we believe the best course of action is to release the defendant. In light of the growing confusion in the interpretation of this ambiguous ordinance, we urge the Supreme Lawmaker to exercise her authority to clarify and or change the law if and as she deems inappropriate. Whereupon, further litigation ensued. Father, Chief Justice, issued the following ruling on September the 17th, 1986. Defendant Derek, age 9, was charged with violating the ordinance by eating pretzels, potato chips, popcorn, a bagel with cream cheese, cottage cheese, and a chocolate bar in the family room. The defendant argues that our precedent has clearly established a pattern of permitting food to be eaten in the family room so long as the eater cleans up any mess. He further maintains it would be unjust for this court to punish him after having permitted past actions such as drinking water, orange juice, and a milkshake, as well as swallowing popcorn, eating apple slices, and eating pretzels, popcorn, and cereal on special occasion. The defendant avers there is no rational distinction between his sister eating 
food in the family room during a movie on a special occasion, and his eating foods in the family room during a weekly television show. We agree. The citizens of this jurisdiction look to the rulings of this court as well as to general practice to understand their rights and obligations as citizens. In the many months since the rule was originally announced, the cumulative rulings of this court on the subject would signify to any citizen that, whatever the technical language of the rule, the real rule is they must clean up after eating any food outside the kitchen. To draw and enforce any other line now would be arbitrary and such unjust. On November the 4th, 1986, the following proclamation, here in known as New Ordinance 7.3, was made by Supreme Lawmaker Mother. Over the past few months, I have found empty cups, orange juice stains, milkshake spills, slimy spots of unknown origin, all manner of crumbs, melted chocolate, and icing from cake in the family room. I thought I was clear the first time, and you've all had a chance to show me that you could use your common sense and clean up after yourselves. So let me be clearer. No food, gum, or drink of any kind, on any occasion or in any form, is permitted in the family room, ever. Seriously, I mean it. And if you can't find potential holes in even that language, then I suggest that maybe you didn't pay attention to the full story. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed this 10,000 subscriber special. Once again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I am eminently grateful that every one of you is here and for all your feedback and encouragement. It has really helped me and this channel to grow. There's no end in sight, my friends. We have much more law to cover. But for now, my friends, this is all. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.